Hey, this is Arthur Hill, Chief Technical Strategist at TrendInvestorPro.com. You are tuned into our YouTube channel for our weekly video analysis. If you like this video, please give us a thumbs up and consider subscribing. So today I want to show you my preferred SMA cross for the S&P 500 and trend identification because we're going to test different moving averages. It's basically a choice between whipsaws and drawdowns. And then I'll show you how the preferred moving average performs on other ETFs. So the S&P 500 is the most widely used and followed benchmark for U.S. stocks. And I would venture to say that the 200-day is the most widely used period setting for a long-term moving average. And you put those two together, and you have a pretty powerful combination. Now, the 200-day moving average doesn't work that well outside of the S&P 500, maybe the NASDAQ 100, as we'll see, because we're going to also test it for QQQ, IWM, and MDY, small caps. But we're going to first focus on the S&P 500. And this is just a nice line chart with the 200-day in red. And you can see quite a few crosses of the 200-day. And we're currently below, we just crossed below the 200-day here in February again. And then the indicator just shows when you're above the 200-day uh, and when you're below it. It's red when you're below it and the percentage above and the percentage below. So we're currently around 2.5% below the 200-day right now. But we really never know how something actually performs until we quantify it with a back test to see the results. And let's take a look at that. So just to show you, here are the actual signals. You can see the red arrow show when you cross below and the green uh, above. And there are a lot of crosses, a lot of signals, and that means a whole bunch of whipsaws. So this is just a long-only test. It buys basically when the S&P 500 goes above the 200-day and sells when the S&P goes below the 200-day. And if you had done that since 2000, 22 years, you would have had a 4% return. And you would have been exposed 70% of the time. So that tells you that the S&P 500 spent 70% of its time above the 200-day. And your drawdown was around 24.5%. And your win, weight was, win rate was 25% because you had a lot of whipsaws. And then the profit factor was 2.24. And that's kind of like the ex post uh, reward to risk ratio. So if all the profits equaled 1,000 and all the losses equaled 500, then that would be a profit factor of two because you would have had two times the profit for the loss, 1,000 versus 500. But if you had buy and hold, you can see you would have outperformed the cross because buy and hold returned 5%. Of course, you had some big drawdowns in 2008, also in 2002, 2003, and then a 33% drawdown in the COVID crash. But we can improve on this. Incidentally, here is the equity curve. So the green line is buying and selling the 200-day cross for the S&P 500. And you start at 100,000, and you're basically flat until 2009, 2010. And you have a little bit of a gain, but then flatten out. And then we got some big gains, and then a bunch of choppy action, and then a huge gain from the COVID low all the way up until the high in November. And buy and hold is the blue line. And you can see that the tuner day was holding up better, performing better up until. 2018 or so. And that's when buy and hold really started breaking away and outperforming. And if I go here, look at the drawdowns, okay? In 2003, you had a big drawdown for the 200-day cross, 24%. And then you got below 18% a couple of times in 2009 and 2020. Now, if we do something as simple as smoothing the close with a five-day SMA, we can greatly reduce those whipsaws and outperform buy and hold. So here is the chart with the S&P 500 and the 200-day. And in the middle, I've just got the five-day SMA in green and the 200-day in red, and the closing line is not shown. Uh, but already you can see there are fewer signals. The red arrows show 
a five-day crossing below the 200-day, and the green show a five-day crossing above. And you can see here on the top chart that she had some crosses below in 2018, but the five-day didn't cross below. And you had a number of whipsaws there in September or in October, November 2018, fewer whipsaws on the five 200-day cross. And so basically what you're going to do is you're going to eliminate a lot of whipsaws. If we go forward here, we can see you had some whipsaws there in June 2020, and you didn't have them with the five-day, 200-day cross. And then there you have the five 200-day oscillator, basically. But again, we don't know this until we quantify it and look at the results, so let's see how that compares. So I've added a line to the table here, the five 200-day cross for the S&P 500, and the compound annual return goes up, 5.88%. Exposure even goes up. How about that? The drawdown goes down to 20%. And then you can see a lot fewer signals. Instead of 62 losses, we only have 17. So we eliminated a lot of those whipsaws. We had a higher win rate, 45%. And you can see the profit factor jumped up to 5. So clearly, just by changing the close to the 5-day SMA is a better solution than just making your just reacting on every close above and below the 200 day smooth it out sit back and wait for a five day to cross above or below before considering any action so here's the equity curve for the five 200 cross you can see it was flat into 2003 but got a little boost there and then went flat again and got a little boost and then fell back and went flat so basically, you know, this 5200 cross was also didn't have much to show for the first nine years. And then we got the bottom in March 2009 and things started picking up. We had a drawdown there. And then we had another move higher in the equity curve as the 5200 cross worked well. And then some choppy trading. And then it just took off. But you can see the blue line is buy and hold for SPY, the equity curve. And you can see this one is consistently outperforming buy and hold. And so this works better than, say, the close versus the 200-day cross because the close 200-day cross generated too many whipsaws and it underperformed buy and hold. So when we're choosing our moving average settings, there's always a tightrope balance. We're kind of like walking a tightrope because, you know, we want sensitivity, but we don't want whipsaws. And the thing is, you know, in order to reduce whipsaws, you have to decrease sensitivity. And in order to get an earlier signal, you have to increase sensitivity. So the five-day is pretty sensitive. If we go out to 20 days, and we know the longer you extend a moving average, the more lag it has, the less sensitive it is, and the fewer whipsaws, but is it going to be too late? And so that's what I've done here. I've got the 20-day moving average is the green line now, and the 200 is the red line. And this shows the 2200 cross in the lower window. And we can see fewer signals, definitely. But you can see they're a lot later. And you can see that this sell signal here in March 2020 was near the low. Now, moving average signals lag. Okay, that is going to happen. And you can also see that the buy signal was after a really big advance. But that's also going to happen after a V bottom, so to speak. Uh, so you can expect some lag. Uh, but the question is, is it too much lag? And the way we can determine that is by looking at the drawdowns. So I've added the 2200-day cross to the table. And you can see the compound annual return goes down. Exposure goes down a little bit. The maximum drawdown goes up, way up, 33%. And that is because of the COVID crash. It was late on that signal. The win rate goes up to 64%, and the profit factor goes up, but you got to decide if you want to go with that maximum drawdown. And personally, I think that maximum drawdown is a little bit too much for me, and I would rather have the lower drawdown and a few more whipsaws than have fewer whipsaws and a higher drawdown. Now, I also tested the golden cross, which is the 50-200-day cross. And it has the highest return, 6%. And exposure, 67%. Had a slightly higher drawdown than the 2200 cross, but, you know, 34% is a big drawdown. 
It had a higher win rate, 70%, and it had the highest profit factor. So the 5200 cross was indeed a golden cross until the COVID crash hit. And then you got that big drawdown. And that's the decision we have to make is if we want to have a little more sensitivity to reduce the drawdowns and live with the whipsaws, because the whipsaws are going to happen. And, and that's pretty much where I stand. I think the 5200 cross for the S&P 500 is my preferred indicator to watch as far as the long-term trend is for the S&P 500. And that affects the broad market environment because the S&P 500 is in a downtrend that is negative for most stocks, most industry groups, and most sectors. And when the S&P 500 is in an uptrend above the 200-day, good things tend to happen. You're in a long-term uptrend. But right now, we're below, and so that argues for a bearish stance, and it argues for being very selective and raising cash. So the 5200 cross for the S&P 500 is one of five inputs that I use for my composite breadth model to determine the market regime. And the market regime is updated every week at trendinvestorpro.com. And this is a model that tells me whether I, we're in a bull market or a bear market for stocks. And this is very important to know because when we're in a bear market environment, you need to raise cash and you need to trade accordingly. So here's the composite breadth model, and you can see it got bullish there in, at the end of May 2020, stayed bullish. We got a little whipsaw here over the last month and a half, but it has flipped back to bearish, the composite breadth model. So I think we're in a bear market regime right now. And I also post some commentary. We were looking at the flag breaks in SPY and QQQ a week ago. So those preceded the declines that we saw over the past week. We had flag breaks. Also, at the, on the market regime page, I update the yield spreads. And we're also see, seeing a widening in the yield spreads, especially look at the triple B spreads. They have been widening uh, this year in 2022. And that shows more signs of stress in the credit markets. And these BBB spreads exceeded one and a half on February 27, 2020. So they're not yet at one and a half now, but they're on their way and they're moving in the wrong direction. They're moving in the direction that's so stress and that is negative for the financial markets. So check out trendinvestorpro.com if you'd like to know more. So I'm running out of time here, but I did do the test of the 5200 cross for SPY, QQQ, MDY, and IWM. I had to run this from 2002, so 20 years, because the data for QQQ only goes back to uh, 2001, and that was the first date I got a 200-day moving average. And so we can see that QQQ performs fine, has a 25% drawdown, but a 9.64 return. But if we look at mid caps and small caps, that'll perform so well with the 5200 cross. And you can see the drawdowns are above 30%. So, and the win rates are well below 50%. So these two don't perform so well, but QQQ does. So if you'd like to know more about trendinvestorpro.com, you can click on the link in the description below. If you like this video, please give us a thumbs up and consider subscribing. Thanks again for tuning in, and I'll talk to you again next week. Have a great day.